Hello and welcome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's Nora Networks Retail Up Wednesday webinar series. Um, so for most of you who have probably been regular attendees and some of you who are new, um, this webinar series is produced to showcase the exemplary partnerships um, uh, in, in forging innovation throughout the retail community and to uncover some of these exciting groundbreaking retail insights. So today, um, I will be hosting this session. My name is Anna Lee. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the iconic, um, a small plug, Australia and New Zealand's leading online fashion retailer for fashion and lifestyle. Um, and I am joined today um, with uh, by um, Carissa from uh, Mr. Consistent and Nicholas from um, Descartes. So we will talk a little bit more with them obviously today, but um, please say hello and wave to everyone. So before we start, um, just a couple of little housekeeping rules. So uh, this session will be for about 45 minutes and uh, we'll have a nice conversation with uh, Carissa and Nicholas. And then we will allow probably about 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session. So throughout this session, you may use the chat function uh, down on the Zoom screen. Um, to see if uh, you uh, have any questions throughout um, the process. So um, I might just give people just a couple more minutes. I think there's a few people probably still um, joining because we're only a minute in. So we might just give a couple of minutes and then we will um, for participants to join and then we can then um, get into the session. Uh, just for a little bit of small talk, perhaps we might just see, um, Carissa, can we just get an understanding of what your favourite cocktail is? My absolute favourite cocktail is a spicy margi, but it has to have the salted rim and ideally it has the chilli salt on the rim as well as the chilli in the margi. So, right, that's a pretty yeah. specific requirement. Is that through a lot if of... If I'm going all out, it has to be. Yeah, right. and is that because of, is that from a test and learn experience? Like you've tried a number of different versions and to get to that... I've absolutely time. tried a number of different versions of cocktails these days, sometimes at 9am in the morning when it's product testing, but I think that the spiciness with the sweet and the sour is the perfect combo, so it's a little bit Very bad. nice. I like that. It uh, <laughs> sounds like a perfect one. Um, and Nicholas, what's your um, favourite cocktail? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty boring, actually. I can't go past uh, gin and tonic, to be fair. That's, um, oh, that's right. <laughs> long time um pretty straightforward but i was lucky enough to try um an el Pichi on friday and uh we partner and i really enjoyed that actually had to super sour just tone down the sourness just a little bit um to make get, get a good balance between sweet and sour but um yeah lovely way to end the week yeah great well that sounds sounds delicious um i think we might just give people a couple more minutes we are only three minutes in so um, just for a few more attendees uh, to join. Uh, if you did join uh, just uh, in the last couple of minutes, we are just uh, holding for a few minutes while we wait for a few more participants to join. Uh, and uh, just reminded that the session uh, is aimed for about 45 minutes uh, and you can use the chat function uh, in the Zoom uh, functionality uh, menu bar to add any questions and uh, we'll have a look through those and uh, address them to our guests uh, when we do. So we might just give it one more minute and then we can kick things off. Should have some, um, you know, background music or something. <laughs> Elevator music. <laughs> Anyone know how to sing? Any attendees yeah. have to sing? <laughs> Not too early for um, a margie, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We had a few a few more attendees, so it's, uh, welcome to everyone. Okay, we might kick things off now. So today's session is about how handling the hype. You know, we talk about hype um, and the hype around building a scalable fulfillment model to match increasing demand. I think that's like probably in layman terms, basically what we want to talk about today is 
talk us through, I think, share share a few of the, the, the journey um, that um, Mr. Consistent has uh, has has gone through through its its growth, um, a very, very impressive growth that is, and how we've kind of tackled that. And of course, Nicholas, um, to add, you know, the role of, um, I guess, things like, um, you know, um, consulting and, and automation and so on in, in helping um, scale, scale that business. So um, I guess that's really what we want to cover. But of course, through the whole entire 45 minutes, we'll get to know and understand um, a bit about our panellists as well. So I uh, look forward to that. So um, maybe I might just throw to um, Carissa and Nicholas to give themselves a little bit of a quick intro on who they are and um, maybe a little bit of an interesting fact as well. <laughs> Put me on the spot. So my name is Carissa and I'm the general manager at Mr. Consistent. So we have uh, premium handmade cocktail mixers, which basically make the cocktail experience as if you were your own bartender in your home or in a venue, wherever it may be, so that every time you shake up a cocktail for your friends or your family, it's consistently amazing. We remove the, the element of risk out of uh, buying ingredients that aren't the right thing, aren't going to taste right, but we still keep the um, part that is really exciting of the shaking the cocktail and being able to be the one that facilitates it for uh, getting the party started, wherever that may be. Um, so my background is in e-com primarily, uh, had a few businesses myself and have found ourselves running with this craziness that seems to be that everybody wants cocktails and trying to pivot from understanding more of a fashion retail background and then applying that within the beverage world. So that's me in a nutshell. I guess the, the interesting fact would be that you stole my cocktail one, which would have been my interesting fact, but I think that um, I have a three-year-old daughter that um, is learning how to shake cocktails as mocktails and continue off this business with us so she's my most interesting fact yeah I love that I love that um and Nicholas uh so hi my name is Nicholas and I am the sales lead um, in the Asian Pacific region for Descartes People Box um we provide a warehouse management solution for ambitious brands focused on selling online um and and looking to to scale quickly and support that that scaling effort. Um, my background is primarily in sort of your traditional logistics space. So think traditional supply chain um, and transport management, also shipping lines as well, I've also been exposed to um, and uh, sort of getting involved in the e-commerce world in the last two years. Um, sort of good timing with the way the world has gone now. Um, and I suppose the interesting fact about me is that I had my fourth daughter in December. So home life is crazy, um, <laughs> but we, we crack on and, and we have fun anyway. Nice. And are you also um, teaching her to shake some um, <laughs> cocktails? No, I'm, Maybe that I'm could uh, to... help with some of the, uh, you know, to, when we need to entertain the kids a bit. So um, thank you Especially. very much for your introduction. So, um, Chris, Maybe we will start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about the the journey with Mr. Consistent, how it all started, and of course, you know, a huge growth um, experience, especially in the last year and so. But you know, tell us a little bit about that journey, and you know, feel free to share any of the stories or anecdotes that you've gone through. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Consistent had been an idea that had been brewing um, by Jeremy, who's our managing director and one of the three co-founders. He had a um, quite a large scale venue in which there was five separate restaurants operating and um, could facilitate, facilitate a ton of customers at any given time. But um, the need for pumping out batch cocktails was something that could slow them down when they would have a wedding or um, a Christmas party or something like that in the venue. So there was um, an identification of a need that he um, needed to fix something in his venue and from there had spoken about that with the other two co-founders Michael who is the product director and looks after the recipe creation and he was at the time the lead bar manager at the same venue so was responsible for essentially the flavor profile that was already going out and then Jared who's the third co-founder um, and he was the person that was the branding behind the um, what was existing already in the venue and what was to come. So between the three of them, they had the um, 
the product and the brand and the, the idea for this um, new way to make a cocktail at home, but it was always a sideline thing. So there was, it was happening a little bit and we'd got the recipes made and it was essentially there in like an MVP type product, but it was not very scalable and not very user-friendly at that stage. A few months later, COVID started to hit and um, Jeremy had sold his venue about a week or two before the restrictions came into place. And um, Jared being in a hospitality, hospitality type business where he was doing the branding and marketing for a lot of different hospitality venues was the first person to be cut from overheads when they needed to trim costs. And then um, Mikey was happy to kind of move on and change scenes up when um, Jeremy had sold that other business. So they found themselves at a time where there was the luxury of having that time to discuss and say, is this something that we actually want to go for? And do we think that it's viable? And originally it had been designed with that venue in mind that it would solve the um, operational slowdown of having to make a hundred cocktails at a time, but all the venues in Australia shut. So essentially there was this fantastic idea and we weren't sure how to make that come to life in the way that we had originally planned. And I guess the background that um, Jared is my husband, one of the co-founders, the background that he and I had was in online retail and thought that that's a way that we could get that product out to people because we had already done that little bit of testing knowing that people were happy and excited to consume the product, but we didn't have the facilities to get it out there anymore. So within that, it was a couple of weeks of them going backwards and forwards and understanding is this definitely something that we're going to go for and uh, figuring out that they needed to do the labeling and like food testing and nutritional panel and build a website. And that all happened within two weeks. So it was a, um, a pretty crazy ride in that time of them going, yep, we've got the time to do it. And let's really try and take advantage and make people happy to be at home when it's a time that we hadn't ever dealt with where everybody's confined to their homes. So we, uh, we went for it. We, we put the website live thinking that, yeah, all of our parents would probably buy a bottle and maybe a couple of our close friends. And um, the, the brand that we had already put out there um, had maybe 500 followers at this time. And we saw a great shift straight away of people happy to jump online and obviously built by the fact that people were already accustomed to shopping online and then there was nowhere else to go. So they thought, yep, let's give it a go. And we we got those first few orders and we were all sitting around going, oh my goodness, this is actually something that people are happy to part with their money with for. And um, within the first couple of weeks, we started to get, uh, I would probably say a couple of hundred orders in the first two weeks. And we thought, what are we going to do? Like, this is this is actually a business now. There's people out there that are already rebuying because they drunk their first bottle within the first week and they wanted to have more. So there was the there was the little tiny production kitchen that was based out of Mubalumba, just south of the Gold Coast, that Mikey was sharing with a sourdough crumpet place. And he was in there after hours trying to keep up and make the bottles. And then Jeremy had the um, his garage, which is so... Um, cliche, I guess, that we started operating out of a garage, but he had his garage set up as a little boxing station and a fridge in there to store it and um, was hand delivering all of the orders that were local because we didn't at that stage have any type of um, post or fulfillment or anything like that set up. And then uh, Jared and I were still based in Sydney at that time, trying to spruik it to all of our friends and then send down bulk orders in the mail and we would do the same thing and drive it around it's to hard. the... Did you start with the same um, range that you have now or was it only a few flavours? Like how did yeah, you kind we, of... Um... We started with originals um, that are kind of a core for any cocktail menu being the margarita because that is obviously... Everyone's had a good time with the margarita. Some people have had a bad time with tequila, but it's never the margarita. Um, and then we had a Bloody Mary, which was then to um, help the, the next day, but also it's a skew that it needs to be made perfectly for a bartender to approve of it. There's a lot of different ways that you can make it. And it's also one of the cocktails that's most heavily judged. So we knew if we could put out a perfect Bloody Mary, then we would have that um, buy-in from the customer knowing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then the third one that we had was a sours. So it's a, 
um, a recipe that probably wouldn't achieve at home as easily, but we knew that we could bottle it and make it um, perfect every time. So we started with just three flavors and then um, we still have them on, on the website as the originals pack and like pay homage to it in everything that we do. So yeah, that's fantastic. It, was, um, it was only a small amount of SKUs that were out there, but um, we, once we saw that demand increase, we um, we thought we we really need to span out a bit further and had originally thought we probably would only stick to cocktails that everybody knows and would trust because we didn't think that we would be able to build the loyalty and the trust behind the brand as quickly as we did. So the next one that we brought out was a Cosmo and um, a pink drink on Instagram was wildly successful for us. So um, that's kind of like, that's our core range now and would never change. But since then we've been able to continue brand uh, building on that brand loyalty and having that buy-in from all of our customers as well, wanting to share that experience digitally has been so helpful. And we've now got SKUs in the range that are completely brand new and made up that don't exist. For example, like you mentioned earlier, Nicholas, the Al Pici, like that's something that is not a standard cocktail anywhere and people are now happy to try it. So it's mm. been, um, it's been a real lesson in understanding that you need to make sure that people are bought in and happy to engage with your brand on that level as well so that they can then go, yep, we're going to support you when you go and do that next cocktail and we'll try that and we'll buy that one again too. So, mm. yeah. And, and, you know, in terms of, I guess, I mean, you mentioned like, you know, after a few weeks, you know, um, you know the, the orders kind of got yeah. to, you know, hundreds, which I think is everyone's, you know, startup dream, you know, yes. like taking off kind of almost overnight. Yeah. Um, and why do you think is that, was that a, 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 an organic word of mouth? What, how did you, what do you think was the driver for that kind of response from customers? I would say it would be a 50, 50 split between word of mouth and then just social media as well. Yep. So, um, social media and marketing is Jared's part of the business and something that he was well versed in. So he knew to be able to get on there and engage with the customer directly. And we still respond to every message that comes through and um, engage with people that way. So it was people knowing that somebody was there behind the brand because we've got this kind of Mr. Consistent person that is a bit of a play. Nobody really knows who he is, but there's actually people interacting and um, discussing that what's going on and asking mm -hmm. them for feedback. And then the other side of it is that I think from in the market where we're playing, there are a few other people, but no one has had the emphasis on freshness and handmade like we have. And I think a lot of people were surprised at how good it actually is. So then that word of mouth was pivotal in um, getting the buy-in and the trust to then have a new person buy it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, in terms of, I guess, you know, everyone understanding how difficult and how um, much 2020 changed everyone's life and lifestyle, um, I think it's also, it sounds like you really took advantage of the opportunity while people sort of had to really force to change their whole entire way of, um, yeah. I guess, uh, socialising um, and really being able to um, create and enhance an experience that they can have at home. Um, yeah. I think you know, we, we, you know, I always think about a cocktail. Why do, why do I have a glass of wine versus, yeah. you know, a beer? You know, why is, why do I have a cocktail? And I think a cocktail really is a real experience um, yeah. in a glass. And I think, you know, it sounds like, you know, what you were offering is also, you know, in the height of, you know, lockdown, that ability to not, not be able to travel, not be able to socialize with friends and so on, but be able to have a moment at home um, with this kind of fancy cocktail to almost, you know, in a minute transport yeah. you to, you know, Cuba or <laughs> uh, wherever you were. So I think that there is, you know, I always feel like, you know, I know um, the way we look at the iconic is, you know, we aren't just delivering apparel, but we're actually delivering someone's individuality and personality in, in a parcel. And I think that's very um, similar when we look at the, the, um, the Mr. Consistent product, it's very much around, um, you know, it's very much around kind of, you know, really delivering an experience. So um, I have a bottle um, here in case I anyone you doesn't, isn't, isn't familiar with uh, the products. So I thought maybe that might be worthwhile. This is um, the Cosmo that uh, Carissa, um, I've not been paid to do this. I've just <laughs> <laughs> have a bottle. Um, 
and uh, you can see the packaging there. Um, Chris, would you mind just telling us, like, Mr. Consistent, who is that? And why did you choose that as your, your kind of front man or branding? Yeah, so Mr. Consistent is anyone you want him to be, essentially. So the, the idea behind him is he's designed off the mixture of the three of the uh, co-founders looks together. And, um, like, Jared has had no experience in a bar, but the other two have, and they've kind of guided the... Um, the design of what he would be doing. So like knowing exactly, like having the armbands on his sleeves and having the right shakers and stuff like mm -hmm. that. It all kind of came together collaboratively like that. But there's no one person that's Mr. Consistent. It means that anybody that picks up that bottle is Mr. Consistent. We know that um, however you want to make it or shake it or put your own spin on it, even if you do that every time, it's going to be the same every time. And it, Mr. Consistent also plays a little bit on the bartender being, and we're allowed to say this because we have a company built of bartenders, but they're very pedantic and very proud of what they serve. And we have a little bit of a, a tongue in cheek play on that and um, a little bit of cockiness that we know that we are the best of what we're doing. And he puts that out there that he's the consistent one that is always giving you the best of what you could get of anything yeah. that you could make at home and sometimes even better than what you do get in a bar. Most I love that. I love the <laughs> listening to the story of a brand because I think it's it's um it really gives you that extra level of um you know depth, particularly when you're engaging with customers. Um, they're not just you know buying a Cosmo; they're actually buying a yes. whole entire. It's they're almost like this, this this bartender is in in yes. your living room, so yes. it, that's pretty cool. Yes. Um, and so before you talked about um how obviously you were then oh my gosh the orders came. Um, you're busy making all of the, um, you know, amazing um, mixtures and obviously sourcing ingredients and then it sort of was garage and all that sort of stuff. So I guess at some point there was a tipping point where you probably looked at things and just went, oh, there's got to be a better way. This is, if this continues, um, you just got to move out of the garage. So, you know, what was the point and when did that happen and how did you go through the, the decision of kind of, I guess, taking that big step of, you know, getting out of your garage and obviously, you know, investing in something a little bit more complex, which probably would have been a pretty big decision. So maybe talk through a, a bit about that process. Yeah. So when we were operating just out of the, the shared kitchen space and then the garage, it was just, it was very much the three or four people involved and all hands on deck trying to get every part of it across. And it got to a, a point where that wasn't feasible anymore. And it was once we could not physically keep up, so we couldn't deliver 50 parcels a day and we, they couldn't make more than they needed to in the kitchen, we thought, okay, we need to have a, another space that we could essentially grow in. And we found a commercial kitchen that had been an ice cream store and was already fitted out, was the perfect spot for us and walked in and thought, oh, this is fantastic. It's going to be our home for the next three years. And we outgrew that space within six months. So... I think it's it's constantly knowing when there is something that's going right and just we're all old enough that we're happy to take a risk based on previous experiences and we've seen things when they have worked in the past and when to um, jump on and go, yep, this is actually working. So once we got that second space, we were able to say, all right, we're going to put somebody on looking after packing the orders and customer service and then we're going to bring on a sales rep. And then when you see the... Um, the benefit of that come to fruition and everybody's then packing boxes again and I was working remotely then and I'd be like okay it's my lunch break I'll come and pack five orders for you and it was not um, something that anybody could keep up with you'd work from 7 a.m until midnight and you still couldn't get through everything so I think it was understanding that if you can continue to go like that we would start disappointing the people that are buying the product and not being able to give them what they're ordering either to selling out or just not getting it to them on time or not having that brand story continue to be a part of the experience that you're getting so understanding when those pressures became too much and then being able to identify that we needed to share that load with whether it's an external delivery a courier or if we're bringing on more staff internally or what that was so yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and and I guess that's when um, I guess um, Nicholas and the team kind of came into the picture. I guess um, I'm sure Nicholas, your business was no doubt um, you know um, booming <laughs> as a result of many people like Carissa and um, who were kind of obviously their business literally you know grown a thousand fold overnight um maybe you know you guys could talk through how that relationship started and you know what were some of the uh challenges and i guess you know how did you kind of arrive to kind of making the decision and how to how to approach the scaling of mr consistent yeah i think for us we identified that we couldn't keep up with what we were doing we had at one time we would have 10 or 15 staff working to pack the orders and sometimes that might be a hundred orders and we had 10 people trying to pack those orders and when you break that down into wages and the cost of that that's not feasible to grow with and we I knew from my experience in e-com that we should be able to get these orders out a lot quicker than what we were but we didn't have the systems in place we were still printing every packing slip and then we'd print the shipping label and cut the shipping label out manually and staple it to the picking slip and then somebody would go and try and find all of those products and then they'd get to the shelf and one of them is sold out and we're going to have to try and contact the customer and say oh let's figure out what you want to do do you need a refund and mm -hmm. we're small at that stage like we're still small we don't you don't really want to offer a refund if somebody's been happy to part with their money for a product so it got to the point where it was absolutely taking over all of our life and thought by the time we get to Christmas, if we're struggling now, we know that it's not going to be something that we're going to be able to keep afloat. And um, I had seen the success previously of PeopleVox and understanding how um, smooth that system worked, more so from the back end. I'd never seen the warehouse side of it, but there was already that level of trust there that I knew it was able to scale from the small amount of orders we were doing up to more than a thousand orders a day. So. I reached out and um, that's when Nicholas came and uh, saved our lives, I guess. <laughs> I love it. Saved the lives and, and saved many people's lives as the result yeah. of making sure that they got their cops out. So, um, Nicholas, maybe let's um, hear from you about like how your experience was. Obviously, Carissa reached out and, um, yeah. you know, share a little bit about your journey as well. Yeah, let me just start by saying maybe I was able to help maintain some of that consistency. Yes. Um, <laughs> but when Carissa first uh, reached out, you know, she, she was, in, to be fair, Chris was in a, a situation that I come across pretty frequently, and that is that you, you can no longer rely on Excel spreadsheets, on printing out every single order, on constantly adding more and more people into the warehouse to, to manage the, um, the growth. Um, and that's sort of, I suppose, the, the first step that, that a lot of brands will take. Um, but Carissa knew that that, as she said, wasn't feasible, ultimately isn't scalable. Um, so it's about getting those foundations sorted out so that then you can sort of um, go on and, and, and chase even more growth uh, because it's one thing to sort of um, lock down the pre-sales effort and, and get those orders booming, but it's, it's another complete different conversation about fulfillment and making sure your customers are getting what they've ordered um, because there's a, there's a bit of a trust element with buying online, right? And we, we saw that change a little bit with COVID. Um, where people were forced to trust buying online, but it's not the same as walking into a store and picking up a bottle or, or trying on an outfit or something. There's an element of, well, you've got my money now, when am I going to get my item? So it's about ensuring that when they do place that order, they get it in time, they're getting what they've ordered as well. So that's part of what I suppose Carissa knew when she reached out to us that she could achieve with, with PeopleVox and with our warehouse management tool. Um, and uh, I think there was a bit of a, a bit of a good back and forth there for a moment, a bit of tension because we had, I suppose, we had to think outside the square, quite frankly, on how we could get um, Mr. Consistent live within the time frame that was required because I think it was August, September, correct me if I'm wrong there, Carissa, that we first, we first touched base and, and we really needed something um, live before Black Friday in November. So it was a bit of a push internally um, to make sure this project was done within the required time frame. Um, now, that's something that I was more than happy um, to help with, but it was, put, so, it was sort of born out of the fact that I could see that Carissa was worried. She was concerned about how she was going to be able to get through that Black Friday period and also across um, Christmas and, and summer, which you can imagine people will be cocktails pretty consistently during that period um so you look we were really excited 
um, to get this project done in time. It took, like I said, it took a bit of outside the square thinking, um, but uh, you know, I think that's uh, that's a typical sort of situation that that we help brands with. That's fantastic. And what do you think in terms of, I mean, obviously you managed to get that in record time, which is huh, really impressive. I mean, what do you think, you know, is the right chemistry and combination of that kind of um, fulfillment partner and, um, and solutions partner versus a customer? Like what, what do you think are the key ingredients to making that um, a successful relationship? Um, am I taking this one, Carissa? <laughs> both of you. I feel like both of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say, um, I would say, um, just transparency on what we're trying to achieve and what, um, from what the brand's trying to achieve and what the solution provider is able to, to deliver on. Because, mm -hmm. um, I suppose that was a big thing for us. Carissa had a time frame in mind. Um, we had to do um some creative thinking on how to get it done in time um but if we didn't have that um transparency and i suppose um visibility over the requirements um we could have butted heads along the way so really important to i suppose um clear the air to begin with know what one of the challenge you're up, challenges you're up against that's that's part of my role that's what i enjoy most about my role is understand the challenges that the brand's going through um and trying to help them uh, address those yeah, and I think from my angle, it was that the first time I spoke um, to you was speaking to a person and it, and it felt like you could understand the story straight away and were engaged in what we were trying to achieve. And with that, there's an element of trust that is then built. So whenever we were discussing what we were going to do throughout that time, I didn't feel like it was a sales kind of process. It was more so that no, let me help you because you, you literally don't know what you're doing with this part of it in the nicest possible way. And I was going, please teach us what we need to do, but we need to get there um, in a really short time frame. So the, the trust of being able to speak to like a dedicated person and get them to understand was, um, I think, really beneficial. That's fantastic. And I think you can tell from, you know, obviously the, um, the, the, the strength of that relationship even today, I think, um, is a real testament to, um, I guess, the importance of, you know, as you said, Nicholas, the transparency, but also the openness. And, and I think, Carissa, you just being okay to sort of say, well, I don't really know what, I don't know. And yeah, um, that, that's a really incredible, um, you know, uh, position and, and be strong enough to say that as well. I think there's lots of people who probably would, you know, perhaps find that difficult. So I think that's um, a really good learning and lesson for, um, for anyone else who's going through a scaling process as well. Um, and Carissa, you come from a fashion background and you work for some really great um, businesses. And so through that process, I know even from my own experience, um, the importance of customer experience in, especially in that fashion uh, realm is a really great starting point to really appreciate um, the emotional connection uh, that customers have with your brand and your product and the experience and so on. So um, you mentioned a little bit around, uh, obviously, you were quite concerned about how you're going to get through, say, Click Frenzy, Black Friday and so on. Um, you know, talk us through how you feel the importance of customer experiences for, you know, a brand like Mr. Consistent and perhaps some of the experiences that you had uh, prior to, um, you know, running um, that business as to how it's impacted the way that you look at um, CX. Yeah, I think if you don't put the customer first, there's no point even operating because essentially we're there to provide them with a product that we hope is going to make their life more enjoyable or solve a problem that they have. And if we're not listening to them and learning from them and talking to them directly, then we're going to become obsolete if we're in this little bubble of what we think we want. We're not the, the core demographic of the people that are buying the product. And we're, we're going to continue to drink it whether or not the, the brand still existed, but it's the customers that are there that are giving us the feedback and saying, no, I want this flavor or I want you to do this or my delivery was too slow or that kind of thing. If we're not listening to them, there's absolutely no point being in business. So I think that comes from being a customer as well. Like I've obviously bought a million things in my lifetime. And if you get that great service, you know that you're going to go back to them and you're going to share that. Um, with your friends and you know you've got that level of trust so that being the front of our whole business whether it's in our wholesale team or when we're talking directly to the consumer it has to be about that customer first and foremost so um, and we're, we're new to this like 
none of us have ever run a food or beverage company before where we're kind of learning on the fly. So we're relying on those customers to give us that honest feedback and help us grow and make the business exactly what they want to see from us as well. So it's got to be 100% or there's absolutely no point doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a common theme, you know, whether it is cocktails or fashion or, you know, groceries or anything yeah. else that's online. Um, that's a real um, important um, feature. And I do think, you know, certainly um, maybe a little bit biased, but, you know, having spent quite a number of years in e-commerce, I think it's also um, been one of the standout reasons, uh, even pre-COVID, uh, that, uh, you know, that people have really been drawn to online, um, you know, yeah. uh, being a real differentiator um, in terms of the experience that they get. Uh, through that particular um, that particular channel, so um, super important and and really great learnings yeah. there as well. Um, so um, Nick, can I um, you know perhaps um, <laughs> turn to you and and um, and ask about like what what are you seeing in terms of obviously you know the the support that you've provided, Carissa has been obviously invaluable, and I think a lot of that has been through. Uh, the experience of um, other businesses that are going through the same sort of thing. Maybe let's talk through about what you see is, you know, um, happening in e-commerce, what are kind of the most um, common challenges that people are going through and what your view on sort of what's a scalable fulfillment looks like um, now and, and perhaps in the future. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So I'd probably say that what I'm seeing a lot of the time now is, and this has probably been going on for a long time, is that, um, brands sort of start out with the sole focus on, um, on getting the product right um, and then obviously um, getting the customer facing um, elements correct so they can convert those, those, um, those searches into sales, right? Now, there's so much sort of time, effort, resources pumped into the pre-sale effort, I'll call it, um, and I suppose the, the post-sale or fulfillment aspect that I refer to it as um, is sort of left by the wayside to an extent and it's kind of an afterthought mm. um but what ends up being is that you sort of there's a big big chunk of your customer's experience that's being affected as a result so you know it's it's one thing to have a pretty website and have great products and have the you know great great marketing campaigns and everything like that but if you're sending the wrong items you're shipping out late you're um, missing items from from a you know, multiple item order um, your customers are going to have a bad experience um, and chances are they're not going to be returned purchases and that nothing hurts a, a scaling e-commerce brand quite like um, you know losing that that first time buyer and not getting a second third time and so on um, purchases so what we're sort of what we're sort of seeing now in the market is that the, when, the, when it's getting to that that point where it's the scalability is unmanageable so when you're going from you know, 10, 10 to 100 orders a day is, is, is fine. Um, but when we get, you know, a couple hundred, several hundred, up to a thousand orders a day, you need the right systems in, in place. And ultimately, you need to get the foundations right right across from, from start to finish with the whole um, uh, e-commerce or purchasing um, life, life cycle. So it's important then to make sure that you've got all the tools um, along the cycle um, working working for you the way you want them to but also scalable so it's it's great to go out and get a, a tool that can sort of help you out today but is going to help you in, in two three years time because as chris has sort of said you know she grew out of a warehouse or, or a, a manufacturing space in six months and i've seen this happen so many times where uh, a brand will move into a new warehouse i think this is great and 12 months later they've got to move you've really got to think three five years down the line your requirements then plan in order to, to hit those numbers um, and then see, ensure that all your tools and all your resources um, that you do have in place are going to support that growth in the long term because you don't want to put in a system, get all your, your staff trained up on a particular system and then pull it out 12 months later because it's going to have a similar impact as moving warehouse locations. Yeah. And I suppose um, what, I, what I might add on to that, Anna, is that... I love working with brands like Mr. Consistent when we're going from sort of that hundred to a thousand orders a day and, and needing to get all the foundations correct and, and needing a lot of help and, and me just wanting to really um, help these brands and see them succeed. But we also, um, we also help some pretty large um, enterprise retailers and uh, we sort of look at where they're, where they've grown and what they're doing and, and what's next for them as well. So I might that, um, lead that into a question for you, if you don't mind, um, because I'd really like to hear um, your perspective being 
coming from a large enterprise retailer and sort of hearing about what role you think uh, fulfillment plays um, mm. in, in your eyes and, and sort, sort of what the fundamentals are for a large business like the Iconic. Yeah, I mean, look, I think fulfillment is probably, you know, the, the most critical, um, you know, part of certainly our um, our business. Uh, when you have no shop front um, and the only way that customers engage with you is through an online and digital presence, um, being able to honour the promise that you made customers is incredibly important because, you know, there is no other way, you know, you've basically taken people's money. In. <laughs> like, um, they're definitely, um, you know, making sure that, you know, that they get their product. And, and that, that itself is kind of what I would call quite hygiene. You know, of course we have to deliver that and we measure those metrics constantly, but I think it is also an opportunity for us to um, make that experience uh, really great for our customers. So that includes making sure our uh, parcels are, you know, made out of the most sustainable products. So recycled and recycled, you know, these are things that, you know, the next level of things that our customers care about. Um, it comes in great shape. And of course it comes in a, in a time frame that we've honored to as well. And if, when, um, and should things happen and they don't, then we need to also be very transparent with our customers and ensure that they're across what is happening and, I think our customers have always really appreciated that. We were one of the, probably the first before, um, I guess some of our logistics carriers actually got um, that, uh, you know, their, their tracking and, and messaging uh, processes um, together. I think, you know, really our business has been around for 10 years and for as long as, you know, I've been in the business, which is over seven of those, we have always been proactive with customer messaging, even before um, our carriers get the message out to our customers around, you know, where the status of their um, delivery is. So I think really understanding what are the most important hygiene factors, uh, things like NPS surveys and, you know, a lot of customer feedback that we get really are, are read by the whole entire business uh, and really shape the things that we kind of really focus on and really unblock in terms of where we know that there are challenges and a lot of those challenges tend to be scale issues so you know when we are you know we're handling tens of thousands of orders um, and uh, a, a day so the complexity that arises in each component and each step of the process can absolutely compound and you know where we've got bottlenecks or other friction points um you know we would share exactly the same fears as you carissa in terms of you know let's make sure that that doesn't happen on black friday for example which is you know obviously the biggest day for pretty much every e-commerce player um so those sorts of things are very similar and i would say regardless of what the size of the business um that you're dealing with, I would say scale is a never ending um, topic that we um, address. You know, we could have a particular plan in place. And if you were to ask us in 2019 what our growth plans were, they were super ambitious. But of course, you know, come 2020 um, and coming out the other end, um, we've already, you know, added a lot more percentage points onto what those growth ambitions are just because obviously that's where the market is and that's where our customers are wanting us to be. And I think being able to be adaptable and constantly review where your business is and question and, and almost challenge the direction that you're going is, um, is absolutely never ending. You know, I don't think, you know, you ever set up um, a fulfillment center and, it's done and dusted, you know, we're tinkering all the time um, based on, and it's not even just volume, it could just be the mix of things, right? It could be, um, you know, the, you know, this month we're, we're doing more beauty versus, um, you know, than we, we had it forecasted and compared to our fashion, those sorts of things will um, affect the processes um, and uh, how we interact technology with our people and the processes all needs to be um, adaptable, really. We don't want to be making those changes on the day. You know, they need to be fluid and understand that, you know, our business will change from day to day depending on what our marketing message goes out and, and so on. So, look, you know, the same challenges, just <laughs> bigger numbers. Bigger scale. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hope that's, like, it could either be reassuring <laughs> or, or it could be like, depressing <laughs> but I, I certainly love it and I certainly love the challenge of um, being able to solve those problems 
uh, yeah. every every single day, really. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's important to sort of take the proactive approach, like Carissa did. She she preempted that the orders were going to surge, and um, she needed to um, take some steps so a couple months in advance to to mm -hmm. point their hair out on Black Friday and. I'm sure you have the same approach, Anna. Just yeah, absolutely. They're, they're the you know, crystal huge, ball. And, and, yeah, and, and they're also like hugely adrenaline rushing. Like those, yeah. <laughs> they're pretty <laughs> exciting. I'm pretty sure every e-commerce player um, owner out there um, is watching dashboards all day, every day on those days. Um, pretty exciting, yeah. So, um, look, we might um, start to wrap up the main section of this, um, this conversation. I'm sure we could talk forever on this, um, and I know that there's been a couple of questions that have been um, sent through. So um, there has been um, a question. I might start with one of the questions that have come through, which is um, from Helen. Um, Hi, Chris. So what did you do in social media to let customers know about your brands? Which one did you find more effective, Facebook or Instagram or others? Um, we initially started with Instagram just because that's our target market is most interactive on that platform. Plus, we're a very visual brand. So if, if you can't um, taste the product in person before you're purchasing it, the next best thing is seeing somebody living that experience and having a great time um, with a cocktail in their hand. So we decided to focus on something that we could share that um, the overall vibe of the brand first and foremost. Facebook has been important for us in terms of being able to orchestrate advertising through the networks, but I would say that overall the engagement is much, much stronger on um, Instagram. And then we've also seen a huge amount of engagement on TikTok. So that's our um, most recent focus is trying to um, find and target that next generation of people that when I log into Facebook, I feel like I'm the old person now because there's nobody on there anymore and I've got to go and find them all on Instagram or TikTok. So um, we're still learning and trying to keep up with the trends, but Instagram has been most um, beneficial in terms of being able to showcase and engage with the customers. Yeah, excellent. And and um, your general customer demographic wide range or is there an, an particular like more women or men or like any or yeah. just like everyone? Our, our target is wide. So we've got, um, I guess, from 18 up until 30 would be our, our core target across both genders. We don't see that often translate into who's purchasing. As we know, mostly it's females doing the majority of the purchasing for the household. So our actual um, database is a lot more heavily uh, skewed towards female. And we do show I guess uh, uh, people females usually put it out there more and they're the ones yes. that are sharing it on social media so it does um come across a lot more fluid that way but we are that's why we have to be active in a brand and making sure that we are engaging the other side of um the yeah the, both genders and making sure it's not just 18 year old girls on our Instagram we've got the yeah the moms and dads on there too no fantastic that well I think you know also you, you can I think it's now with I guess most of the lockdown restrictions lifted, um, you can sort of make it a lot more um, social at home as well, right? And, and yeah. probably quite much more economical. I'm looking yeah. at the prices of them, yeah. certainly a lot cheaper than, you know, having to go to a bar, obviously not yeah. exactly the same experience, but certainly yeah. you know, very, very good value. Yeah, fantastic. And we have another question, uh, and this is probably for Nicholas, but I'm, I'm sure um, Carissa jump in as well. Um, and please, everyone, please, um, you know, keep sending through your, your questions. I'm sure that our panelists will be more than happy to answer um, anything that you throw at them. Um, what human resource strategy portal do you recommend, Nicholas, to supplement the tech systems in warehouse during peak periods? So what I usually say, thanks for the question, Becky. Um, what I usually say um, for this one is that you need to sort of have, we generally recommend like a champion on the, on the system, um, on a system that you're using. So this can be a warehouse manager, an operations manager, or just some senior people in the warehouse. Um, and then, then the next part of it is really down to your, your pick and pack process or your, or your picking strategy. So if you're simply going and grabbing a garment or a bottle, putting it in a box and sending it out, 
you know, you can get some some pretty cool benchmarks, you know, like people packing, you know, 80 orders an hour during peak periods um, on, on the PeopleVox system. Um, however, if you've got a little bit of a different sort of system where, you know, we've got um, brands that do like handwritten notes with each order, that's a little, that takes a little bit more time. So you're going to need a little bit more people to handle those, those peak periods and even just the quieter periods during the year. So it really comes down to your, um, your, your, your fulfillment operation and how quickly you're getting through those orders. Um, but ideally, you'd have a, a champion in the system. Um, but we we also see um, a component there, and we've sort of built this in, is that we allow um, brands to go on and get, um, you know, you go out and get a bunch of casual staff, say for Black Friday, we can add a bunch of users onto our system for those periods for just a minimum of a month at a time um, to get through your Black Friday. So, you know, we've got, you know, huge brands like Lounge Underwear in the UK will probably go and get 10 to 20 casual staff for Black Friday. And that that helps alleviate the pressure when those um, those huge, you know, 100,000 orders comes through in a day and that sort of thing. Thanks, Nicholas. And Chris, like when you were resourcing for those busy days, like what was the approach that you went in with, you know, in your own experience and any learnings or lessons from those experiences? Yeah, I think the, the most important part for us was that we needed to be able to have something that everybody could jump on and use and understand without a huge amount of training. So we definitely have like a warehouse manager that knows every part of it and can uh, troubleshoot if we've got any issues that we need to fix. But it's that no matter what position they are in the warehouse or if they're even in a different area that we need to reassign them to, with, a, with only a few minutes, I guess we can train them and how to do something. So for me, it was that was the importance of not having to go through a week of training to just get on and pick an order. So everyone's pretty fluid in our warehouse, even though we do have like the, the set roles, but they can do everything. So that yeah, was pretty cool. asking everyone in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, actually, you know, even for us on, on um, the big, uh, days uh, we often have staff from um, all of our people from all over the business yeah. come and help us um, pack and you know it's a really great um, yeah. it's a really great environment and a really great vibe and I think it really Absolutely. connects people a lot to that customer so I feel like you know even if it wasn't you'd probably continue to do that even you know in the ongoing years yeah that's fantastic to hear yeah. um, and maybe yeah. just one last one to just um, you know wrap up I guess um, Carissa uh, obviously, you know, some really amazing um, products I can't wait to get into my Cosmo with um, uh, dried mm -hmm. lime, which I thought was pretty cool. Like I must say, like, you know, seeing the Instagram and adding something like this, it makes it, the, my cocktail look pretty pro. Yeah. Um, so obviously these were sort of additional products that you've um, added. So are you seeing sort of a further expansion in your range? What's the future for, for um, your business and, and where it's going to take it? Yeah, we've got um, one key item that everybody asks us for that we will bring out next month. So um, we honestly over and over and over get asked for this. It's the most searched thing on our website. So we'll, we'll fulfill that customer need very shortly. But um, after that, we, we're a bit of a fun company. We like to do things fun. So it's whatever um, people or brands we want to work with in the future, just working on that. But the next biggest thing, I guess, for us is taking it and being able to distribute the product worldwide. So we're pretty limited within the Australian shores at the moment, just due to um, being able to freight something that's a bulky product and has a shelf life. So we're just working on that as our next port of call and looking at Asia as the first market and then going into the States after we've had a little bit of a test there. So um, global domination, is that all right? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Take over the world, Mr. Yeah. Consistent. I love yeah. it. Well, that's an amazing um, story and what an incredible aspiration. I think um, listening to your story, I think is resonates um, pretty much with anyone, uh, no matter what size and what product that they're uh, that, that their business is, yeah. is operating in. Um, I think, thank you so much for your honesty and your vulnerability as well. I think it's not easy to um, talk about you know, a journey and, and um, some things that, you know, probably, you probably made it sound quite, you know, yeah. fluid, but I'm sure at the time it was uh, pretty stressful, particularly when it's your own business and you have skin in the game. I think that's really 
um, pretty big. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for your generosity of your expertise and, and your time. And obviously you've done an incredible job supporting um, Mr. Consistent and the team there. Uh, and thank you so much for the audience for making time to join us. Um, and hopefully if you um, are able to, um, I guess, uh, watch this um, post, um, this session, uh, more than welcome to, I think, uh, drop Nicholas or Carissa a note after this to ask them any questions that perhaps may have come up and you haven't had a chance to ask. Um, keep an eye on the Nora Network social channels and, and website for any upcoming um, other webinars and let us know what type of topics uh, that you want us to cover. But uh, please join me in thanking Carissa and Nicholas for today and of course Nora for organising all these sessions. Thank See you. you Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Carissa. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.